We've got a great lecture plan for you guys this evening. Superbug infections of today. You will learn a lot. If you pay attention to this lecture, lecture, you will get a lot of gems out of this tonight. As usual, for those of you who came out tonight, I will do a question and answer, um, not record it. My giving back to you for coming out this evening. Um, and maybe even getting some muscle testing. I'll be talking about some cool things at the end about muscle testing that we kind of correlate with some of the things that I'm going to go over with infections as well today too. My mini lectures. Uh, we are all the way to September, October. October, um, I'm going to do a cancer prevention lecture that is not recorded. I'll go over that flyer next slide. And I'm also going to do a movie night in October as well. Uh, November, December, I'm going to take those months off. In 2016, I might change things around. I might take a, sometimes I kind of go every other year as far as the mini lectures go. Uh, the mini lectures are not recorded. They're mostly in office or sometimes at the Nobi Library if I do the movie nights. Things I like to say that I don't want recorded, that's where I'm going to say most of those things at. So moving along. Cancer prevention, it's time to rethink pink. That will be next week, Thursday, at the office, not recorded, October 8th, uh, 6 to 7 p.m. Kind of go, gonna go over some of my old cancer lecture stuff and incorporate some new things at that lecture. Should we be focused on the cure or the cause of cancer? Next month, October Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Everyone's gonna be running around in circles running for the cure or the cause. If the cure was out there and the pharmaceutical companies were so focused on the cure, there wouldn't be any money. The money's at the treatment of cancer, not the cure. We're running for more false hope than anything. And you'll understand these charts that I've showed at the past lectures over the last five, six decades, the uh, rates of cancer deaths have not, or have, have not decreased compared to your heart disease and other medical conditions, and yet all the money being donated to medical research and all these other corporations and you know, uh, run for pink type things has not benefit us as a whole. And yet they're gonna push for, you know, Prevention is pushing you towards mammograms and increased screening and early prevention, that kind of stuff. Yet the true literature shows that there's increased rates of unnecessary procedures and biopsies and those types of things with having the mammograms. And they've said a lot more false positive type problems with the mammograms that they're saying 50 years and older is where they kind of start saying, well, maybe you should start doing the mammograms then and you guys, most of our veteran patient, patients know how we feel about mammograms. The yearly dose of radiation for something preventative, we are more pushing patients to having thermoscans. Thermoscans measure the heat thermography off the breast. So if there's any hot spots, whether it's cancerous lesions or there's infection, blood flow go, gets, go to that area and increase that area where the temperature rises and you could pick up those hot spots. I've actually went the last few weeks, a um, few weeks ago, met Dr. Hostra that is in Birmingham at this clinic, the Thermoscan, and he was showing me his technology and things that, you know, all the things that he could scan and thyroid and that kind of stuff. These are who we use for our patients in Michigan, and just kind of talking with them is just kind of interesting. You know, not every Thermoscan place is the same and he's been around for years and this is who we dealt with and who we trust and we get no kickbacks for using him or promote him. And tonight, for you guys coming out, I have a few coupons for some of you ladies. The cancer killer is the cause of the cure. Um, my highly, most highly viewed YouTube uh, lectures on YouTube. That is the one that I'll be talking about with the mini lecture and kind of revising some of that a little bit next week. Big Bill is a hidden side effect of cancer treatment. Total cost of cancer care in the United States is projected to reach more than 100 billion by 2020 according to the National Cancer Institute. The U.S. Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention released a study last year 
that found that compared with com people without a cancer diagnosis, cancer survivors are less likely to work and more likely to struggle financially. Another study out of Washington State found that the longer a cancer patient survives, the higher the rate of bankruptcy. These medical bills are bankrupting people, not just cancer, and yet cancer medications are going through the roof year after year. Going through the roof, and it's to the point where seniors today are hitting a fork and roll of, you know, this it actually personally happened with my grandparents with their medical bills of saying, well, maybe we should get a divorce so the state takes over your bills and it doesn't bankrupt us. This is what medical treatment's coming to today. It's ugly. Maybe we should stop asking why real food is so expensive and start asking why processed food is so cheap. There's a big correlation to cheap food and the amount of health problems as far as obesity and diabetes in healthy food and less health problems. And that's in this study, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. The highest rates of ob obesity and diabetes in the United States are found among lower income groups. The observed links between obesity and social economic position may be related to dietary energy density and energy costs. Refined grains, added sugars, and added fats are among the lowest cost sources of dietary energy. They are inexpensive, good tasting, and convenient. In contrast, the more nutrient-dense lean meats, fish, vegetable, vegetables, and so forth cost more. You are what you eat, simply. Um, the movie Food Inc., I've always, you know, anytime I've done weight loss talks, I've always talked about that documentary, Food Inc., showing a guy going through the drive-thru, he's got diabetes, he's got a family of four, He's got on all these medications and he's crying because he can't feed his family on 20 bucks. He could go through a drive through a Burger King, feed his family, yet he goes through a grocery store and you try to buy 20 bucks worth of healthy food. It's not there anymore. It's a whole different age today. My January lecture, I'm very excited for this lecture. Very, very excited for this. My mini talks, mini lecture talks about the paleo diet. I'm going to take what I do with the paleo diet. I'm going to incorporate it with Dr. Tent's clotting factors and heart stuff that we both work with in the office. I'm going to put a twist of functional medicine on top of this. This lecture is going to be awesome, and I'm very excited to bring this in January. We're doing some advanced lipid panel screening. The VAP studies, we're actually working with uh, Dr. Cassidy, who's uh, the next office, uh, or the right in our office, next room down. Uh, his phlebotomist has been very nice, running a lot of blood stuff with us. I actually got drawn today for this myself, so I can use my numbers for next lecture and do some advanced screening with patients. If you've had clotting factors ran before, this is taking it to the next level because we're going to check factor five, we're going to check MTHFR genes, um, measure the density and the sizes of the HDL, LDL. So this takes it to a whole different uh, state as far as your cholesterol screening goes. So I'm excited to kind of bring that forward with you guys. So we're running patients right now through some of these and just kind of building up some cases for next lecture to go over with. And yes, I'll be talking about statins. It seems like this is like beating a dead horse day after day, patients after patient, explain the statin stuff and your brain 60% cholesterol. Look around you, all this dementia, Alzheimer's. Suck the fat from the brain, lower your cholesterol, watch your brain function, go straight down the tube. And I'll be quoting a lot of this stuff with my next lecture with Dr. Brownstein in his new book, The Statin Disaster. So when next time I have to go through an hour talk, talk about statins, I'm going to direct them to my next lecture so I don't have to go over the same story over and over and over. Dr. Brownstein's a great guy. I get Dr. Tent to smile a little bit more at these pictures that we <laughs> once in a while take. <laughs> he is a happy guy, I promise you that. 
Um, Dr. Brownstein's a great guy. We uh, share a lot of patients back and forth. He, you know, obviously practices in West Bloomfield. We're in Novi, so we get some more of the musculoskeletal patients as far as the chiropractic patients that kind of go back and forth. And I know if you share our hands, we got some Brownstein patients out here too. So great guy, great mentors with me. I, you know, can't say enough about him. For the patients that have side effects with regular statins, now they want to incorporate a new statin with you guys. That's going to cost twice the amount of money and drive all the medical bills up. So if you got muscle pain, aches, pains, and fatigue, and just Lipitor, Crestor doesn't do it for you, now they're going to add some new medications to you. And what's interesting, because you know, I was talking with patients and telling them, you know, 50, 60 years ago, the normal cholesterol used to be about 240-ish, give or take skewed medical research from pharmaceutical influence has driven those numbers down to about 200 now and now if your cholesterol is over 200 they want to get everyone on a statin everyone's got to be on a statin no you know even if it is lower than 200 it's preventative medicine today let's put everyone on a statin everything that you're seeing with the statin medications and cholesterol is what's happening with blood pressure now, this was just a week or two ago. Well, you know, 120 over 80 used to be normal blood pressure, but I guess skewed medical research is now showing us that maybe 120 over 70 is where we should have blood pressure at. Maybe it should be a little bit lower than the 120 over 80. I tell you what, I treating seniors who drop their pressure below that, it's an absolute disaster. They're dizzy, they're tired, they're lethargic, slips and falls. If you're on blood thinners, you bump your head, look out, you're done. You fall because you're dizzy, because your blood pressure medication, you fracture a hip. That could be a big issue. So you keep following these protocols and wonder why you're tired and lethargic all the time. This is why. I would love for a medical doctor to take his recommended dose of uh, pharmaceuticals as far as statins, blood pressure, medication, that kind of stuff, and see why, and see how he feels, and he would understand why all those patients are coming to us saying, I have no energy, I'm tired, I'm lethargic, I feel like crap. Look at all the medications you're on. Go to Florida, you know, September's here, right around the corner, now we're going to have all our snowbird patients go down to Florida. Heaven forbid they have to step in a medical doctor's office down in Florida and they see, wow, you're not on any medications. We need to at least get you on four or five different medications. You want to hit, it's unbelievable, and he could testify to that right here because you snowboard, you snowboard down the floor, so heaven forbid you have to go in the office, look out. It's an absolute mess, isn't it? Now, I, this is a case I'm working with right now. I just want to show you how much of a mess screwing around with your blood pressure is when it's not a problem. 33-year-old male, young guy, Asthma, chronic cough, wet to dry, currently coughing up yellow phlegm, heaviness in his chest last week, on steroids, allergies as well. This has only been going on two years. He had asthma as a child but didn't have any problems, didn't have to use an inhaler. Come down here. He's on a blood pressure medication for a year. His blood pressure was 140 over 90. I go, that's not that bad. They want to put you on a blood pressure? Yeah, he said. My doctor said he thought that was a concern and decided to put me on lisinopril. Lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor. One of the side effects of an ACE inhibitor is a dry cough. His dry cough was being treated with steroids and antibiotics. His whole system's a complete mess because it's all destroyed from doing all the antibiotics and steroids. He can't breathe and he feels he's sitting in his chair sweat and he's like I got an elephant on my chest and I can't breathe he's like I've never had this problem and all stem from blood pressure medication to this medication now to steroids and breathing and treatments and inhalers it's only been as that and this was the beginning of September towards the end I've seen him for two visits now and he's about 30 35 percent better after the mess he's been through the very I told him I had a talk about this case and there's a reason I'm going to be talking about this whole dry cough and you know mismanaging the blood pressure stuff as well. 
blood pressure vaccine moves one step, step closer. This is exactly what we need. Imagine controlling high blood pressure with just a jab in the arm. Scientists are now one step closer to this reality after creating an experimental vaccine that in rats provided six months of protection against high blood pressure. Most of the hypertension today is insulin resistance. I'm gonna treat insulin resistance with a vaccine experimental on top of that. Last year this time, we were talking about Ebola. Where's Ebola? And wasn't Ebola supposed to spread to the United States from Africa and you know we had experimental vaccines that we were talking about with Ebola last year? This stuff's embarrassing. Trace amounts. This is the movie night that I will be hosting October 29th at, not the library, but this will be at our actual office. I will be serving non-GMO popcorn. Last time I did popcorn at movie night, I had someone asking about the popcorn. Of course, it's gonna be non-GMO popcorn. This is worth mentioning, you know, I realize I've been talking about all these lectures and I haven't talked about my wife's office. This is my wife on the left here. Um, you seen her at some of my little lectures and I pulled her up and showed some muscle testing stuff. We are both chiropractors. We met down in Georgia. She's originally from the South. She's a Southern gal from Alabama. I'm from Michigan. Graduated from um, chiropractic college at Life University in Georgia. Some I, somehow I told her I thought Al Gore was going to be right about global warming and I got her to move up to Michigan. <laughs> So her office is in Milford, New Hudson area, Central Family Chiropractic. And the reason I'm talking about this is I've had some patients try to look me up as far as the office here in Novi and called her office thinking I worked there. I do not work there. This is uh, baby Ethan. He's about five months old as of last week. This was Labor Day weekend on the left. We uh, had our first flight. I was a little tense for a first flight. I'm not going to lie, I had a 16-ounce beer before that flight <laughs> to kind of cool me off, and I was prepared to buy drinks around me if I had to. He was so good on that flight that people were asking me, your baby's so good, what are you doing with him? I'm like, I'm crossing my finger. I got a connecting flight. This is just the first one here, so he did great. Now, talking about flights and ears and headaches and pains, is when I was a kid, my head hurt like crazy and I hated going on planes. I was so full of strep bacteria, and you hear these kids aching and complaining on an airplane, they are full, so full of strep bacterial issues in their ears, this is why they're in pain. Milk and ice cream feeds those infections. I'm going to talk about staph infections tonight, strep infections. I'm going to talk about viruses. I'm going to talk about yeast infections. I'm going to tell you, if there are certain things that feed these infections, you'll never get over certain infections if you're constantly feeding them. Where are you going to get your calcium if you don't drink your milk? Drink your milk your entire childhood life, plug up your ears from the dairy, antibiotic year after year. That was my childhood life, and my mom was a nurse, so I got every antibiotic after every antibiotic. Our lectures are on YouTube. I'm slowly learning how many insomniacs we have out on YouTube land. <laughs> but I gotta say, I do love our YouTube fans and our Skype patients. They do look out for us. Um, every health news thing that comes out, they try to fill us in on everything. And if we're not getting it, they'll make sure we're finding it too. So it's been cool. DiverseHealthServices.com, that's the website. Uh, our blog, follow the blog. If you sign up on your email, if you want it directly sent to you, if not, you can click our diversehealthservices.com, click the blog link, and you can see every blog that I've posted. Uh, follow us on Facebook. I'll post some in between articles, and uh, you got to use social media to your advantage. I'm going to go through some certain cases tonight and things I'll talk about. Use social media to your advantage today. It's a huge networking device. And Twitter as well. That's one of probably the only reasons I'm on there. I will tweet you guys back if you want to tweet, but I'm using social media to my advantage, and I'm going to explain that. Uh, Skype patients, the Skype stuff's been a lot of fun. I'll roll through a few Skype cases. Um, how far will you go for your health? This lady's 64 years old. This is my Susie from Mississippi. She's had two visits at her office. Her first visit, she drove all the way up from Mississippi to come to the office. 
Uh, since finishing a liver detox, she's had red, painful, scaly rash on her neck and has kind of moved up her arms and the face. This is a picture of what we're dealing with. It was pretty wild. She did some crazy liver detox, pulled something off her system, and woke up some kind of animal. Um, I treated this as a staph bacterial infection and yeast infection both together. Got some pretty cool results with her, and skin stuff's very, very tricky. A lot of times this is an uphill climb. Skin problems, skin is where health conditions last present. A lot of times it's deep internal with a lot of patients, and skin's the last area where things will kind of present. She had a, we were following up, going through Skype, and um, a month or two later, she's looking great, things doing pretty good. She had a little bit of a backtracking issue on her when she was, drove up to the office and some diet stuff uh, she slipped up on and some of the stuff started breaking out on her wrist again. But when she was in the office just last month, this is her. Wow. Night and day difference. So last lecture I was talking about getting into a lot more functional medicine testing. So I'm going to talk about some intriguing cases and how we're slowly incorporating some of this with some trickier case, case, uh, patient cases tonight. So it's an eight-year-old male. Mom would like to get him off Concerta. His behavior is distracted easily, physically busy, obsessive repetitive behavior, deals with anxiety, better on medication during school. But mom's like, I'm scared of his personality. He's not my same son being on this medication. His mom has a purple heart, golden heart, of how far she's going with her children's health and realizing, man, I wish I could start from the beginning and do like everything you guys talk about at your office, and yet I'm kind of started here, now I'm kind of backtracking from things that uh, have happened. Now, ADD, ADHD, autism, Asperger's, those types of things we like to run hair analysis with. His aluminum was up in high aluminum and some other things. I believe he, we were working with the lithium, lithium deficiency with him too, uh, trying to slow him up a little bit. Um, but the all uh, aluminum levels will mimic ADD, ADHD type symptoms with a lot of patients. These medications are being heavily, heavily abused. Year after year, more people are being put on these things, whether they need them or not. The college-age kids are abusing these ADD medications. Girls love them because it keeps them skinny, curbs their appetite, and they can think. People want an edge over the next student in college. They're all abusing these medications. I, trust me, this is the new animal of today. So we worked with heavy metals. We worked with some parasite stuff with them, you know, just a simple daily protocol. He's doing good, trying to take it to the next level. Genova Labs, I've been doing the Nutri-Val kits with uh, some of these kids. Um, this is a combination of blood and urine analysis. So it runs through checking antioxidant levels, B vitamins, minerals, a little deficient on the zinc, uh, all the Bs. This is your number one deficiency of these kids today. The B vitamins, I guarantee you, are the number one deficiency with all the kids. Even adults, too, will have issues with this. Pop, tea, alcohol, diuretics, sugars, carbs, sweets, you will drain your B vitamins. Your B vitamins are water-soluble vitamins that you do not store in your body and you need to obtain daily. And a lot of people are losing more than than they're gaining them. So. A few of these slides will be a little blurry. I had to stretch them out a little bit. Oh, that'll be the next slide. B vitamin deficiencies. These are your biggest symptoms as far as B vitamin deficiencies go. Weakness, fatigue, poor appetite, neuralgia, craving of the sweets, muscular soreness, headaches, insomnia, dizziness, energy issues. Energy is going to be worse in the afternoon. After meals in the afternoon can be B vitamins. So roll, rolling through a bit more of his analysis, and this is where it gets just a pinch bit blurry. I had to stretch it, but I just want to talk you through it. This is a green marker, yellow, red. This is your vitamin A, vitamin E, CoQ10. The ones I have circled are plant-based antioxidants that he's deficient on. Glutathione levels are low, 
It gives me markers. Green's good. Yellow needs some help as far as nutritional help, and red being more in a severely deficient state. The B vitamin markers, you can see the majority of the X's are in the red and some in one in the yellow. He was just severely deficient in all his B vitamins. Essential fatty acids, it measures your essential fatty acid levels, need for probiotics, need for digestive enzymes. It's a very, very cool analytical test, especially if I have an autistic child that can't communicate with me and muscle testing will only get us so far, I'm going to get a lot more analytical and start running more of these Nutri-Valve kits with these children. It checks malabsorption and dysbiosis markers, bacterial overgrowth, yeast, fungal yeast overgrowth, it checks your metabolism and your energy pathways as far as carbohydrates, fat metabolism, it has a neurotransmitter profile. This is a very analytical profile that we're starting around with the kids. I'm very excited to bring this forward. Uh, if you're interested in this for your child, or, um, some of those things I've mentioned, as long as you don't have Medicare or Medicaid, we could run them. It's a, right around 149 out of pocket and the insurance picks up the rest. It's a combination of blood and urine and I have a mobile phlebotomist that will go to your house and have this ran. Certain out-of-state patients I can't run this with, but check with me at the office and I'll double check into those. This case is an amazing case, and this is probably a case why I will never retire from what I do. This girl, 11-year-old girl, Faith, from Oklahoma, is diagnosed with RETS, which is an autism spectrum disorder. It's an autistic-like reaction, and they just call it RETS. After, having, after about 18, 22 months shots, she had double series shots around 18, 22 months, and after that she stopped walking and she stopped talking. Stopped walking and she stopped talking. On top of that, she has seizures as well. And I told her I'm gonna put her picture in a video on this lecture tonight. And I got a confession to tell her mom, we almost, I almost did not take her case. Almost did not take, I looked at the new patient coordinator came up to me because we got a Skype appointment from, uh, for you from Oklahoma. Um, she's not walking, she's not talking, autistic-like reaction, Brett syndrome. Do you think you could help her? I go, I don't know what we could even do with her. I'm like, she's been to all these specialists, all these pediatricians out in Oklahoma. They haven't done anything with her. She hasn't, you know, it hasn't walked or talked since, you know, going on two years of age. I go, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I'm, you, know, you know, what the heck? You know, she's reaching out to me. Maybe I'll Skype with her. So I took it on. Obviously, we want to run a hair analysis to look at heavy metals. Her heavy metals were fine. She had a little bit of a lithium deficiency. And I'll tell you what, a lot of people are walking around with this, and you know it. I promise you that. She was grinding her teeth. So I put her on the daily protocol that we use at her office. She go, I go, she's too young to grind her teeth. Kids, adults, a grind due to stress, kids grind due to parasites. I put her on some parasite stuff. After a month, month and a half, I had a follow-up appointment with her. I saw her mom's face glowing across the screen on the Skype thing. I look back and I look at the chart. She started walking by herself. She hasn't walked by herself in almost 10 years. Amazing. Almost did not take her case because I didn't think we could do anything with her. And her mom's just completely ecstatic. She's like, she's walking on her own the first time in 10 years. Here's a picture of her. That's Faith, and that's Faith and her sister. In my final edited version of this lecture, you will see a video of her walking. Awesome case. So, 1983, 2016. Look at the amount of vaccines and things that are being injected in your kids. Since this lecture, 
since my last lecture and this lecture, I've had three California Skype patients that are not even dealing with the new law changes that have come across California, which your politicians are bought and paid for by the pharmaceutical companies. I said, we're done with this stuff. We're moving out of state. I had a patient, another one from California, another Skype one. She goes, my husband's job brought me to California with my kids. She goes, we looked at your CDC recommended data thing of vaccines. She goes, that is absolutely outrageous. We hardly even vaccinate our kids out in England. And you're going to recommend this for our kids and now pass it in a law that you're going to force me to put this in my children? She's like, I don't think so. She goes, the food you guys eat in your country is outlawed in my country. She goes, I'm, I don't even want to know where you guys will be in the next five, ten years. We're done with this stuff. We're just going to move back to England. Inside your brain, I get very heavy about the vaccine and talk a little bit more in depth with how it reacts with the brain. Uh, Dr. Russell Blaylock, I base a lot of my talk on that lecture with Dr. Russell Blaylock. That's available on YouTube and DVD. Dr. Bradstreet had a very questionable death. He was treating autistic children and he was getting an 85% improvement rate, turnaround rate with them. GCMMAF, this is a thing that I'm going to talk briefly about and I'm going to let you do more of the research and I'm going to let you go down the rabbit hole. Last lecture, last lecture of Dr. Tennis, we knew about some of the stuff going on and with some of these doctors coming up missing, we just didn't want to talk too much about it. So since it's kind of out there, I'm going to kind of put it a little bit more out there. You go down this rabbit hole and you search this GCMMAF, GCMAF macrophage activating factor. It's a natural immune component in your body. This immune cells suck up particles and activate your immune cells to elicit an immune response. In a quick, simple nutshell, cancers, viruses, certain vaccines will increase a nagalase enzyme in the body. That nagalase enzyme uh, blocks GCMAF. It blocks your immune system. And Dr. Bradstreet was using certain GCMMAF component, whether it was, it was injectable, sublingual, suppository, to reverse that nagalase enzyme and block or go back after that your immune system doing injectable forms of the GCMMAF reduces the nagalase enzyme and goes after cancers and viruses and was going after him helping these autistic children. Very intriguing stuff. Use social media to your advantage. Just go on your Facebook and search GCMMAF and there's a group of about 3,500 people. It's a closed group that you've got to ask to join and you can join that group and you cannot find GCMAF in the United States but you will find every single source and where it's at and how much it costs through Facebook social networking. That's all I'm going to say about it. You guys research the rest. So what weakens your immune system? Overuse of antibiotics, blood transfusions, vaccines, ibuprofen, operations, toxic environments, uh, prolonged stress. This is just a short list. There's certain things of Dr. Tent's lecture, when I'm talking about the viral stuff that I want to reincorporate, reiterate, which was a great lecture, by the way, if you did not see his last lecture, Viruses Part 2. Part 1 is the autoimmune lecture. So everyone's asking, well, where was viruses part 1? The autoimmune lecture was pretty much the part 1. Viruses part 2 was more an expansion with that. So here's the cell. Bacteria versus a viral cell. A healthy cell, bacteria grows around the cell. Antibiotics kill the bacteria outside the cell. Viruses live inside the cell. You cannot use antibiotics on a virus because the antibiotics don't go inside the cell to work with a virus. I just want to show this to you because a lot of people are being overprescribed antibiotics for viral conditions. Antibiotics aren't always the answer. Antibiotics do not fight infections caused by viruses like colds, flus, most sore throats, bronchitis, and many sinus and ear infections. 
They will not cure the infection, will not keep people from getting, uh, other people from getting sick. They will not help you or your child feel better, may cause unnecessary, unnecessary and harmful side effects, and will contribute to antibiotic resistance. Viral bronchitis, these dry coughs, viral sinusitis, viral headaches, Everyone's being overprescribed antibiotics today, and then the next route's the steroids. I will see a lot of springtime patients where I have to fix up their immune system because of this mismanagement of going after viral infections with antibiotics. Vitamin D is your number one preventative thing of the flu, upper respiratory infections, and small colds. Studies have shown that there is a link between vitamin D levels and the risk of getting a respiratory infection. People who have had low vitamin D levels tend to have higher chances of developing a respiratory infection. That's a vitamin uh, council.org. Vitamin D also works greatly with seasonal affective disorder because that vitamin D component is a precursor to uh, serotonin levels in your brain. So keep the D levels up. Full spectrum lighting absolutely works with the people that get that seasonal effect of depression during the winter. Fluoride based antibiotics. There was a, supposed to be a patient here tonight that I was even gonna, gonna draw him up on the spot to talk about his nasty side effects that he's had from about a month and a half ago with Cipril. Cipril has garnered a black, black box warning from America's FDA, which uh, the manufacturer has been forced to highlight the possibility that the drug can cause tendonitis, tissue swelling, tendon rupture, and muscle weakness on top of all these other side effects on the right. This medication is nasty, and this should be used as a last resort. I see too many people during the winter, uh, z packs and these fluoride-based antibiotics that are absolutely tearing them up. Your orthopedic surgeons are very on top of these medications because they're tearing up their shoulders rotator cuffs, hips, knees, and destroying their joints. An orthopedic surgeon will cringe knowing that you've used long-term use of fluoride antibiotics on and off. Just like a urologist will cringe at patients using Motrin daily for headaches because Motrin will destroy your kidneys. Overuse of these antibiotics have been correlated with the MRSA infections, with the, which is an antibiotic-resistant uh, staph infection, as well as C. diff infection. C. diff attacks more, attacks more of the gut and creates a lot more gut issues. And this stuff is serious. We are living in an antibiotic resistant state today. I had a patient, it was going, it'll be going on two years, coming up, uh, it'll be about a year and a half. She went in for a pneumonia and she was mid to late 50s. She went in for a pneumonia, they gave her um, z pack and what else was it? She was treated for her pneumonia. They gave her antibiotics. She ended up contracting C. diff. She turned septic from the C. diff, was in, put in an intensive care unit, and passed away. 50s. This stuff is serious today. You want to stay out of the hospitals. Deadly hospital infections will rise unless changes are made. Each year, an estimate of uh, 648,000 Americans develop infections during a hospital stay and around 75,000 die according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. A new study from the agency concludes that hospitals need to make important changes or the rate of deadly hospital infections will continue to rise. You want to stay out of the hospitals. Simple procedures today aren't that simple anymore. People are going in for surgeries and you will be put on an antibiotic whether you have an infection or not because infection rates are so high in the hospitals that they'll automatically just put you on one. I'll even be talking about the urinary tract infections at the end and how that's a hospital induced mess as well. Andrew Fleming, his warning was back in 1945. Uh, Fleming could already see the future of antibiotic misuse. There is a danger, he said that the ignorant man may easily underdose uh, himself and by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug and make it them resistant. And we are living in antibiotic resistant and year after year trying to make stronger antibiotics. People are having more reactions to the antibiotics than they are to the infection and your body will not 
learn the infection and deal with the infection if you go after it with antibiotics after antibiotics year after year. Evolution of the bug, you can kind of see this chart. Kind of goes through the timeline of the staph infection from 1928 and just kind of showing how it's just increased and grown in the antibiotic resistant up to 2000 on this chart. And it's only worse now. Well, let's dip into the viral stuff. Uh, this is the viral panel that we like to run at the office. Epstein bar, CMV, herpes 1, 2, 6, herpes antib uh, antibodies, thyroid antibodies, and the parvovirus. IgG and IgM. You want both of those ran, and I'm going to explain the importance of why IgG and IgM are being misread today, too. Epstein Barr virus, best known as infection mon mononucleosis, um, a lot of cancers and autoimmune conditions are contribute to untreated mono. Epstein Barr virus, which is mono, lives in your liver. That's key. That virus lives in your liver and it lies dormant in there. It has been correlated to MS. A lot of MS patients uh, have old MS or have old EBV teeters with the bottle stuff and have had a history of those infections. And that's very well known in the literature. You get the CMV, cytomegalovirus. The virus remains with you for your life, but it's not always active. CMV may cycle through periods during which it lies dormant and then reactivates. If you're healthy, it remains dormant. Transmission of the virus occurs through expose, exposure to bodily fluids, including blood, urine, saliva, breast milk, <coughs> tears, semen, uh, vaginal fluids, uh, not by casual contact. Now, both of these are liver viruses. What's gonna aggravate a liver virus? Things that block your liver pathway, but I'll get in that the next slide. I kind of jumped one ahead. These are symptoms as far as acute and chronic CMV. CMV, EBV, herpes, not herpes, but hepatitis A, B, C, all liver viruses. If you block your liver pathway, you will give life to those viruses. If you take too many antibiotics, if you take too many steroids, you take NSAIDs, ibuprofen, motionavil, Tylenol, antihistamines, antidepressants, pain meds, vaccines, blood transfusions, and antacids, block that liver pathway you will give life to that liver, or you give life to that liver viruses. You block that liver pathway, you will grow cancer in your body as well too, because you're blocking your detox pathways. What else is gonna feed a virus? Foods that are high in arginine will feed a virus. If you're low in arginine, or if you're high in arginine and low in lysine, you will give life to every bit of viral infection in your body. You get patients in one yesterday, you know, thinking that she's got um, you know, some food insensitivity to wheat and peanuts and that kind of stuff. I was telling her the things you're eating is full of arginine and you're irritating that virus in your head and that's what's aggravating their, your so-called viral headache that we're going after. Here's the key thing tonight with this lecture. If you deal with chronic viral infections, arginine will feed those infections. If you're a chronic bacterial person, Dairy, and especially milk and ice cream, will aggravate those infections. If you're a yeast person, sugars will absolutely feed those infections. Low calcium, calcium herpes in the gut. Several top immunologists believe that the single most critical disease-fighting element in the human cell is ionized calcium. If you are low on calcium, your viral stuff will flare up. Calcium and lysine, L-lysine, are your first two breaks to any and every virus in the body. Too much arginine, not enough lysine, not enough calcium, you'll irritate your viral stuff. This goes to people that even go in the sun too long and you're out in the sun, or if you're supplementing, this is key going in the winter, if you supplement with too much vitamin D and your vitamin D is going through the roof, you will suck your calcium levels low and your viral stuff will flare up and get worse. Our chronic viral patients always say, I feel worse being out in the sun for too long. It's because they're losing and depleting their calcium levels. That is absolutely key to understand with these viral infections today. Herpes 1, 
cold sores, herpes 2, genital herpes, herpes simplex, antibiotics, low calcium, low arginine, or low calcium, low lys lysine, high arginine, you will flare these things up in a herpes. Most herpes patients that get symptomatic lesions know the arginine list because these things feed those infections. Uh, herpes 6 infects nearly all human beings, uh, typically before the age of two. The acquisition of herpes 6 in infancy is usually a, uh, sympt usually symptomatic, commonly result in childhood fever, diarrhea, and a little bit of a rash. When it activates later on in individuals, MS, cancer, optic neuritis, seizures, epilepsy, fibromyalgia, AIDS, chronic fatigue syndrome, some of these things that they get called. Typically, the Epstein-Barr virus and CMV is one of the ones that I see a lot get pushed towards the whole chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia in a lot of patients. Shingles. Shingles is herpes zoster. So I'm going to explain a viral infection to you guys. This is just one viral infection. CMV, EBV lives in the liver. Herpes zoster lives in the dorsal root ganglion, lives in your nervous system. It hides here. Your body does not attack the nerves or that be an autoimmune condition. It's smart, it hides from your immune system, and it waits till your immune system is compromised until it comes out. Stress. You get severely stressed out, your cortisol goes up, your immune system goes down. That's when this virus will come out of the nerves and attack you, and when your body wakes up, you get these skin lesions, and that's your shingles. If you've had chicken pox, yes, you could have the herpes zoster as far as shingles goes later on, but it won't be until your immune system's compromised or low calcium, too much arginine, low lysine problems will flare these things up. Parvovirus. So often infects preschool uh, or school aged children during the spring in the form of rash on the cheeks, arms, and legs. In adults, uh, parvovirus uh, B19 can lead to seronegative arthritis. This is a dog virus. Keep French kissing your dog and you might run into this problem here. <laughs> right? Thyroid antibodies. Um, I, this is very intriguing. I see a lot of thyroid patients that uh, get in the wrong hands, could go in the wrong direction very quickly with an aggressive endocrinologist. Thyroid antibodies tests uh, used to help diagnose autoimmune conditions involving the thyroid gland, primarily Hashimoto's and Graves' disease. Uh, Hashimoto's is more of the hypothyroid issues, Graves' is more of the autoimmune, both are autoimmune, but Graves' is more autoimmune hyperthyroid issues. Certain key elements and minerals at the right doses help typically work with thyroid antibodies. A lot of gluten insensitivity is correlated with thyroid antibodies being up. I want to throw this in there, but thyroid antibodies is absolutely correlated even with viral infections in the body. I've seen so uh, some very key cases in patients that viral infections floating around the body attack the thyroid drive the antibodies up and throw symptoms as far as a hyper or hypothyroid, kind of throw them back and forth. So viral infections could irritate that as well and, you know, attack that thyroid is key to know, you know, the muscle testing is, you know, when I talk about the muscle testing later on, this is where the muscle testing really comes key in which direction, how to treat these types of cases because not all of them are simple. Now, IgG, IgM, IgG, IgM antibodies. IgM on any viral stuff, herpes one, two, IgM is an active infection. IgG antibodies are antibodies showing that you've had a past infection. Viruses are very cyclic. They cycle. When they cycle a second and third time, the IgM antibodies aren't always going to be high, and doctors don't understand when treating viruses, especially mono and other things, that it doesn't have to be high. Treat the patient, not the lab work. Treat the patient, not the lab work. 
see way too many people dealing with recurrent Epstein-Barr stuff where they get pushed in this, you know, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, but they, they said they checked my Epstein-Barr and they said that everything was fine and my doctor now says this is, this is my head, go to your psychologist, pain medication, sleep medication, so forth and so on, and you know, it's, it's a mess from there. This is a prime case. This girl's 13 years old. You see, this is fairly recent. This is just last month. I'm not digging back too far on these charts. Mid-June, off balance and gait was off uh, with mid-July numbness in both hands and had some fainting, uh, fainting spells. Admitted to the hospital and they put her on high doses of steroids for a week. Diagnosed with ADEM and found four lesions on her brain and two in her spinal lesions through an MRI. She was losing motor function. She couldn't even write. She was having a hard time writing and had all these symptoms going on. And I looked at the, whoever ran the blood work did run some pretty comprehensive stuff, but IgG, IgM, they were thinking, well, this not a virus, you know, all, all the IgM antibodies are perfectly fine. It's not an issue. They did not know and they're still kind of working with this, and we're kind of co-managing this. They did not know, they're thinking this could be pediatric MS or Lyme disease, because she had an issue with Lyme. Uh, she got bit by a tick, and one or two of the antibodies were high, and her symptoms are all over, all, all over the place, and their neurologists are scratching her, their head. They came into me. I cranked her neck. Her atlas was so far out of place, I put her neck in place and I put her on some small antiviral stuff. This was just one visit, one visit. Hands not tingling as much, only two times yesterday. Uh, we talked about a little bit more vitamin D stuff. Her symptoms all went away, knocking out, just adjusting her atlas. And that was the first, actually, I had one more visit after I put this one up, but her symptoms are gone. Her Neurologist is absolutely baffled and doesn't know what to think because they're doing high steroid doses with her and she numbness in both her hands, losing function of the right hand and just putting her neck in place is kind of cool getting cheap results with this. And when we looked a little bit more at the EBV stuff, Epstein Barr virus, the mono stuff, IgG, her antibodies are high. She's had this infection. It doesn't have to show IgM, and they're going to get tripped up on the IgM and not understand viral stuff. And I guarantee you, these brain lesions she's having and spinal cord lesions, that's the viral component that I'm treating on her. I'm adjusting her neck, keeping her neck in place. Her symptoms are gone. I'm still kind of going after more of the viral component with her, and we're just kind of letting things play out. But the, her parents are very happy with how far she's come along. She's from the east side of the state. She comes an hour away to come to the office and she's had some pretty cool results. This has been a fun case. Why do I have colitis? Why do I, the, these guts are an absolute mess today. Absolute disaster. This is a chart from the movie Genetic Roulette. Your mid 90s, all the increased rates of genetically modified engineered components in our foods and the rates of irritable bowel disease as far as Crohn's and ulcerative colitis have just gone through the roof. The food is killing us today, absolutely killing us. I highly recommend you watch this documentary if you want to learn more about the GMO stuff. That's where I got that chart from. It shows a farmer in there feeding pigs 100% GM corn, genetically modified corn, showing all their health issues that they've had. Pneumonias, dying, croaking, skin issues, completely changing it to organic corn. In two to three weeks, all their health problems completely disappear. It speaks for itself. If these Roundup Ready foods, when we eat, when insects eat Roundup Ready components and it goes to their stomach and blows up and the insects die, yet it's supposed to be safe for human consumption, when we're eating these things, it's destroying our guts, creating leaky gut issues and pushing people to this, this Crohn's problem and this ulcerative colitis problem. It's an absolute disaster and it's only going to get worse. Super GMO fear is now being realized. The development of this so-called gene drive
technology promises to revolutionize medicine and agriculture because it can, in theory, stop the spread of mosquito-borne illnesses such as malaria and yellow fever, as well as eliminate crop pests and invasive uh, species such as, uh, as rats and cane toads. This is where this is going. This is scary stuff. You're, you know, geoengineered foods, this is only going to get worse. And when you look at the politics behind this stuff, I've talked about this before, and it's only getting worse because House passes bill blocking states from requiring GMO labels in, on food. This is getting passed from the House to the Senate. If this goes all the way through, this is going to be a complete disaster of them not being able to label, have labels on our foods showing whether it's GMO or not GMO, and it doesn't remove matter if you're Republican or Democrat because both parties are getting money from companies, this Monsanto company, to be protected on that side, all at the expense of our health. So when we get patients in here, why is my gut a mess? Why am I pooping blood? Why am I gaining weight like crazy? Why is my stomach hurt all the time? Talk to your politicians. You want this crap labeled, as it is in most other countries except ours. I always talk about that one foreign patient in my lectures. What's in your food? Because my stomach hurts all the time and I'm gaining weight. I was laughing at this guy when he first came in because he's from Germany. I go, you're the guy I'm always talking about, or one of the guys, type of guys I'm always talking about in my lecture. So I'm going to use your chart in my lecture. Acid reflux, a lot, of, a lot at night, worse with carbs or alcohol, protein shakes cause gas. Um, had it as a baby, would spit up with milk, had some issues, but limited in Germany, didn't have much, many problems. Comes to the United States for, since 2006, his stomach's a disaster. What's in your food in the United States here? My stomach hurts all the time, and I have all this acid reflux. <laughs> yes, welcome to the United States. <laughs> Fix his gallbladder stuff, talked about the GMO stuff. This is just one or two visits. Doing way better with the heartburn, acid reflux, you could drink a few beers, not have any problem with it. All I did is fix his gallbladder. It was more of a gallbladder issue more than anything else. Rancid oils. The American diet is full of rancid oils. I had so many gallbladder issues this summer. July in the barbecue season really seemed to stir up the gallbladder symptoms. Gas, bloating, indigestion going between loose and tight stools, burping, belching, gurgling the stomach. All the so-called IBS symptoms. A lot of this stuff is gallbladder stuff. You got to use the right pills at the right doses if you want to get the right results, period. And that's what I did with him. Just fix his gallbladder. November to January is the biggest time that you'll see the gallbladder issues with the holidays and the rancid oils stirring things up. It's just unusual because I saw a lot during the summer, during July. Eating out will whack your stomach too. All these restaurants use rancid oils that will crap up your stomach. Europeans use cleaner oils and you eat from a farmer's market and just have fresh food. And it's the oils and our foods that give it shelf life that crap up our stomachs and screw up these gallbladders. Now you want to talk about a real bad gallbladder issue and just not digesting you know, fats at all. This is Crohn's disease. 35 year old male, Crohn's disease, delusional, suicidal, sometimes cannot speak in formal words, does not care for personal hygiene needs. Poop and blood, um, skinny as a pencil. You know, we've had patients eat a bad piece of lettuce that have had have Crohn's and also of colitis and almost lose their life by eating a bad piece of lettuce. Poop in so much blood that they're anemic, pooping so much that they're dehydrated to the point, go to the hospital, get on antibiotics, or get on a steroid and get hydrated because we can't do anything with you. These guts are serious today and this is no joke what these foods are doing to our stomach. So we're doing, I'm using more of my functional medicine stuff, we're doing more stool analysis with these cases and I'm doing a three day stool sample kits. And I want three days and not one day because if I do it a three day one, I'll be more likely to catch parasite issues if there's parasites in a three day catch versus a one day catch. So this is all stool analysis and I'm just gonna walk you through it. It will give me 
any infection component that might be lingering in your gut. He'll show me, and he had a lot of inflammatory markers that are up in his gut. It will tell me any insufficiencies if you're not digesting your fats, if you're not digesting your proteins, if you're not digesting your carbohydrates. Also tell me imbalance, imbalances of the good and natural bacteria in the gut if there's any problems with that. So I know it's a little blurry. I had to stretch this to kind of get this on here, but I'm going to kind of talk you through the top to the bottom. Digestive markers goes through your fats, inflammatory markers were high, and gastrointestinal markers on the bottom. The main thing on the top, all his top markers, all the fat was in his stool. He was not digesting his fat whatsoever. Your brain's 65% cholesterol. If you're not digesting your fat, you're going to starve your brain. And he has not, he's been so undernourished and not absorbing anything and not absorbing his fats, this is what's driven him into this delusional suicidal realm. You have your gallbladder taken out. You won't digest your fats after having your gallbladder taken out, and you'll run into this problem unless you're supplementing with the right supplements to help support you without a gallbladder. This slide here just kind of goes through uh, bacterial markers as far as good bacteria. So we could customize a uh, probiotic for your needs depending on which markers of all those germs come back high or low. Uh, other microbes will look at good bacteria levels as far as the good E. coli in your uh, gut or additional. This Klebsi pneumonia has been popping up high in a lot of people that have been running this on. He did not have any parasites in his stool on a three-day catch. We were treating him already for gallbladder issues, so we already did suspect some of the things that we did find based off the stool analysis. The cool thing about the stool analysis is it will give me prescription medication things as well as natural components. If you had to go the realm of prescription medications, and I'm not promoting that, but if you had to go that realm, it will tell you if you're sensitive, if that bacteria is sensitive to that agent, or if you're antibiotic resistant to that. Same thing down here, it will go through nutritional things that will tell us if it's low inhibition, it's not going to work that good. If it's higher inhibition, it'll work better with these two to work on this Klebsi pneumonia bacterial in the body. The guessing game is going away. These guts, we got to take a lot more serious because they are very tricky. A three-day stool analysis kit is available at the office. Call and ask for me. Uh, most insurances will cover a good bit of it. Runs 109 out of pocket. The insurance picks up the rest. Genova Labs, like I said, I'm incorporating a lot more of this functional medicine to help some of these trickier cases and fill in the gaps in our office. Now, when someone comes in and they got a real bad case of this ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease stuff, I like recommending a GAPS diet. A GAPS diet and a bone broth component, you've got to rest the gut. If your gut is severely screwed up to the point where you go to the hospital, they're gonna put you on an antibiotic, or they're gonna put you on an IV to hydrate you, and they're gonna tube feed you to rest your gut and not get anything in your gut so they could get the inflammation down when they give you steroids. This does the same thing. You want to heal the gut using components with the bone broth to help fix the leaky gut when you're talking about that and fix some of these guts uh, that had this heavy bleeding. And it doesn't take much. You know, like I said, a bad piece of lettuce, someone going 20, 30 times a day. This is serious stuff. Now, going back to urinary tract infections, bladder infections, and heaven forbid you're in a hospital and you are catheterized, if you have something settled on your bladder or urinary tract from this hospital, induced infections today, you will have to struggle. I struggle with about a good handful of patients right now that have been catheterized and I'm trying to fix their urinary tract, whether it's a urinary pH issue lack a good germ because they do antibiotic after antibiotic and they're not using the right probiotics to put that right germ back in their urinary tract or the primary infection hasn't been dealt with properly or they mutated that infection and created secondary infections. These are the messes that we're dealing with today as far as this superbug resistant stuff. 
you don't want to go to the hospital and be catheterized. You have something like this settle on your bladder, you will deal, this is the stuff that gets pushed into interstitial cystitis with a lot of these patients in chronic pelvic pain. Candida infections. What's going to push people into a yeast infection? Birth control, hormone replacement therapy, steroids, antihistamines, and acids, antibiotics, hepatitis B shots, the standard American diet, which is full of sugar. If you are doing those on those things, are doing that standard American lovely diet of sugar, you will never, never get over a candida yeast infection. Some of the ones that I struggle the hardest with with the candida yeast component are um, my diabetics because their blood sugar constantly runs high and it just continues to feed these infections. And a lot more people are having issues with this candida than what we are even, Dr. Tent and I are even realizing. Uh, this is what a yeast tongue looks like. Look at people's tongue. You can see if they got yeast issues, sometimes low B vitamins and low hydrochloric acid will kind of present symptoms like that as well too. So I we run a lot of food sensitivities at the office. Why is my gut hurt all the time? Why am I gaining weight? Well, let's run some food sensitivities because if your food sensitivities are high, Sometimes gut inflammation will be a problem and cortisol will be an issue that cortisol goes up and your weight will go up. This is a prime case of, this lady came in, she wanted, wanted to go over some weight stuff. She was on, what was it? An antidepressant that is very well known for packing on weight and I told her straightforward, I don't think I could get results if you're on that medication because that medication is just gonna completely work against you. We ran these factors and this is what leaky gut, low hydrochloric acid looks like on blood work. She, and I've been, now this is the sensitive seven that we run on the blood work, IgG. And I've been throwing in the candida antibodies on this as well too. I can't believe how many candida components I am finding on people. I got a lady right now that I ran this on her all the way down to Florida. All this lower, severe, severe lower abdominal cramping irritable bowel symptoms, cramping and pain, all these GI specialists and doctors she'd been to down there, and I'm treating her on a computer, and she's, I had a follow-up appointment with her uh, last week. She's crapping out segments of parasites in front of her doctors. Her cramping's going away. She goes, how come you're treating me on a computer, and I've been to all these fancy doctors and all these exotic tests, and we can't find out what's going on, and I'm clearing the stuff out, and my pain's going away. You live in Florida, you live in Mexico, guarantee you parasites will be an issue. I've seen so many people, Florida and Mexico, just soak with parasites. Um, but candida is a big issue. Leaky gut is, you know, leaky gut is when you got a gap in your intestinal lining, these things will cross the uh, gut barrier, get in your bloodstream. You might build antigens, antibodies to certain food particles, then your immune system attacks your gut, then you get the gut inflammation, then your cortisol goes up and your stomach hurts all the time and you gain weight and feel gas blowing and ingestion all the time. Antibiotics, steroids, stress, genetically modified foods will push you into having the leaky gut stuff. I'll put this slide up here for a reason. You guys have seen some of my old lectures when I first worked here. I used to wear glasses. I had an infection in my left eye that took me three, four years to get rid of. I swear that infection was from when I worked at the hospital as a patient transporter because I did afternoons and I did a few midnights and then times I did midnights studying for college and cramming away. I was tired and I'd rub my eye being at the hospital, pushing patients, rub my eye. And I had a nasty eye infection when I worked at the hospital and something sat in my left eye for years that took me forever to get rid of. And it's to the point where it built a chalazion, which is like a little pimple on the inside of my eyelid. And on my lunch breaks, there's an ophthalmologist uh, at the end of our complex that I'd have to get my eye, flip my lid, numb it, cut it, and drain it. And it looked like someone punched me across my face I come back after my lunch break with an eye all puffed out, and that is why I wore my glasses a lot in the beginning because it took me, I didn't want my contacts in, and I didn't want to aggravate that, but it took me three years to get this thing under control, but I did not give up. 
I did not give up and I was persistent. I never did an internal antibiotic for this. I never had stopped doing antibiotics since my teenage years, since I got off the milk to ice cream. I never, my earache stuff, all of that stuff disappeared. Hop on that, I'll start clearing my throat more. Any dairy, start clearing my throat, my ears will start aching. I will feed my infection because I'm more bacterial. Some people are more viral, some people deal with a bit of both. Learn your immune system, know which way you are. Some people deal with both issues. It took me that long to get rid of that stupid thing and it never came back. Yet people are gonna not learn their body. You have to learn the infection. Your body has to learn the infection. If your body never learns infection, you will deal with the same infection year after year, antibiotic after antibiotic, destroy your immune system, weaken your immune system, and then acquire other problems. Your body has to learn the infection. I kid you not, I had probably two, three grand of supplements put in my eye that I was doing to get this thing under control. I kid you not, it's the first time I ever talked about how much I had an issue with that eye at one of my lectures. Your body has to learn an infection. Pathogens go into your red blood cells. Your red blood cells shoot out antibodies to go after these infections. But if you chronically do antibiotics, you won't ever learn the infection and you won't strengthen your immune system with this. It's as simple as that. I told a few patients I'll talk about Lyme disease as well. This is becoming very prevalent and it's very scary. Lyme is known as the great imitator as it can mimic many other disorders including multiple MS, arthritis, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, ALS, ADHD, Alzheimer's disease, and some other things. This is very prevalent in the northeast of the United States. And I'm having a lot more people check these antibodies. Acute Lyme's, acute Lyme is easier to treat and reversible. Chronic Lyme is very, very tough. And I've got a handful of patients that I set up in their own little network. I give them all their telephone numbers and share their you know, treatment things and things that I'm doing with them along with some other integrative techniques with this. And I can tell you right now, nobody is getting great results when it comes to chronic Lyme. And if you wanna shoot me an email and prove me wrong, go right ahead. No one is getting great results. And I've got patients doing traditional route as far as a port in them, doing antibiotics, one pushing two years straight, create more problems on top of that in the long run. And other patients, 20, 30 grand in an alternative treatment, treating Lyme issues with hyperbaric treatment and infusions, IV, um, blood irritation and all that kind of stuff. No one is getting awesome results. Contact reflex analysis. This is the muscle testing that we do at the office. This is what helps me determine you know, the clinical blood work, you could run blood work and all your lab work all day long. You will see all of the infections there. Contact reflex analysis is the muscle testing that we use at the office that we will find the subclinical infections. Subclinical infections, you will have symptoms of things, but not necessarily always see it on the blood work. And this is how I differentiate, well, if the thyroid antibodies are up, I'm gonna muscle test and see whether it checks for a virus. Maybe it checks for vitamin A with true hyperthyroid issues. You know, the muscle testing really helps guide me, especially with the Lyme patients, because the Lyme patients, some of their symptoms aren't always Lyme. It might be a staph infection. It might be um, mono acting up on it. The muscle testing tells me which direction I'm going to start treating the patient. Treat the patient, not the lab work. Clinical versus subclinical. Now, I tell you what right now, the two most hidden infections people carry in their body are from their teeth and their toenails. Teeth and toenails are making people sick. Subclinical infections, you'll ache behind your knees. I'll stand and go through a crowd of people and poke behind their knees. And the achiness and pain that they get is, are their lymph nodes and that's where the infection has parked. Armpit pain from a bad tooth. Teeth and toenails are the two most common uh, infections that we will see in the office. Low-grade infections that you won't see on your blood work. 
the Asira is back at the office, is upgraded and renewed. So if you want are interested in that, I've ran that in the past. That is up and going again. Um, these are the supplements that we use at our office: Doctors Research, Standard Process, Biox Research. Online ordering orders over 125 of uh, shipping is free. This is uh, my previous lectures that you could find on YouTube. Thank you, Aaron and his crew from about Toxic World and down. The video recording has been really good. Above that, it's been pretty shady. <laughs> Thank you for coming out tonight. If you have made it to the end of this lecture, this is my email. Questions, comments, concerns, and then it's talking to Joyce in the back. I would like to get some renewed topics for lectures. If you have some topic ideas or want something addressed further in an explanation, I will make sure I address it in the future on some lectures. Write down my email if you want to shoot me something in the future. There it is. Congratulations for the people on YouTube who have made it to the end to see that. If you want me to talk about that kind of stuff, shoot me an email. Thanks. Mm -hmm.